Hi, this is Joe Brzee, CEO and founder of Spurgio, and I have a very special guest with us here today who I'd love to introduce to you. His name is David Perodin. He is the Director of Student Services for the DeForest Area School District in DeForest, Wisconsin, where he oversees special education, counseling, nursing, social work services, crisis preparedness and response for the district's 3,500 students. David, though, was also our first recipient of the National Spurgeo Award for Excellence in Social Change, which I had the pleasure of personally presenting to him at the Great Lakes Behavioral Summit this past October. In addition to both creating and coordinating that Great Lakes Summit now for the second year in a row, uh, David has worked as a speech-language pathologist, school principal, director of rehabilitation, and recently became a committee member of the Wisconsin Center for School, Youth, and Citizen Preparedness, where he frequently presents across the state of Wisconsin about how to identify and promote practices and emphasize school safety. And as if that weren't enough, his professional <laughs> commitments, you laugh, but I'm going to share this. This is important. You're completing your PhD in educational leadership and policy analysis right there at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And... You're a parent. I mean, to top it all off, you, you are a, a parent. So folks that are watching this that are in education, I mean, this comes as no surprise. If you're in education, you're a busy person. But you are you are truly have a full plate, my friend. Welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate the introduction, uh, Joe. And uh, again, it was a wonderful to receive the Springy Award um, in October. And it's uh, proudly displayed at my office in the forest and uh, has been a topic of wonderful conversation. So I appreciate that. Well, it was well learned. I mean, you were certainly the most qualified candidate, having done so many different things with so many groups of people and, and really shown a commitment to the community at large, which is, you know, the, the main emphasis behind that award and, and the recognition was certainly well learned. So couldn't have thought to given it to a better person. So well Thank done. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. So your expertise uh, really ranges quite a wide scope. Uh, you know, a lot of what we talk about here at Spurgio is related to bullying. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, talk a little bit about school safety and just see what you know, wisdom we can glean from your experience. So the first question I have for you is, in your current position with DeForest, you, you have some opportunities to get around and travel and uh, meet educators from around the U.S. What are some of the challenges related to bullying that both students and educators seem to be struggling with? Um, Joe, I think right off the bat, uh, bullying is difficult to define. Um, that what happens, everything kind of gets put into the funnel of, of bullying. A pure conflicts, disagreements, and with that, everything, again, initially seems to be categorized as bullying, and then through investigating, uh, there's decisions of what is bullying and what isn't. Uh, as I talk with people around uh, our state and, and on a national scene, um, what the concern is, imagine that if, if you and I uh, went to the doctor and the waiting room is full and, and everybody comes in and sees a doctor and the doctor says, you've got the flu, you've got the flu, you've got the flu. Um, well, probably not everybody does have the flu. Some people might have other things. I mean, if you have liver failure, that's treated differently than the flu. So what happens uh, to educators is they, they um, get bombarded with everything being bullying. And I think the tendency then is also to kind of desensitize the situation. So there's definitely a need to educate staff, students, and parents about what is bullying and what is, uh, for example, a pure conflict. And when I say a pure conflict, uh, for example, um, you know, a couple of kids on the playground and, and one wants to pitch the uh, ball in the game and the other one wants to pitch it too so they have a disagreement. Uh, well, that necessarily isn't bullying. You know, that's likely a pure conflict. Um, so I, I, I think that work needing to be done more with students to educate them, certainly encourage them to report incidents and um, but not to automatically put the label on because I think that has a tendency then to again desensitize um, of what is bullying and what is not bullying. Um, in, in addition, Joe, 
underreporting is is a big problem. I was at a state conference in Wisconsin um, uh, right before Christmas, and probably three hundred educators there. I was talking with the school principal, excuse me, and their school had uh, middle school had over a thousand students, and the principal said, "You know, we only had." 15 reports of bullying last year. And I thought, well, something's not right with that because your prevalence of bullying is higher than, you know, 15 student, 15 instance in your school, um, even if you have an outstanding program in, in super culture. Um, but digging into that a little bit more, there wasn't a reporting system. And a lot of things that, that got reported in that case were reported, you know, I, I would say maybe it's just disagreements or conflicts and so that you know to me was really an injustice to that school system of saying um you know we we don't have kids that bully i mean it's very it's very sporadic it's just peppered across um you know the year and of course that isn't true with that said i mean schools have made great strides toward addressing bullying um but what happens too is there becomes a fear of what if we have a good a very good effective reporting system and all of a sudden, we have to come out to the community and parents and say, look at the number of bullying reports we did have. It's higher than it was in the past. Well, certainly it was, because now you have a reliable reporting system that kids understand and parents. But once you kind of get through that initial bump, and we experienced this in the forest, uh, then you do you know, find a decrease in your amount of uh, bullying and your referrals, because again, everything kind of gets put in there. At first, and you ed educate people, it, it stratifies out into bullying and pure conflict and other things. Um, so that that's kind of an interesting, you know, two sides of the spectrum. I attended a presentation by the um, Antigo School District, Antigo, Wisconsin, and they started a program where they have uh, student ambassadors that they train who identify and intervene when there's bullying happening in K-12. So these are students that volunteer for these um, specialized trainings. And if they observe, um, you know, instances of bullying that are happening right in front of them, they take leads in stepping in and, and putting an end to that. And what, what an incredible way to empower um, students. And again, a voluntary program, and they indicated um, been, it's been very successful. And they actually showed some video clips and some interviews of, of students so I think uh, the other piece is forgetting to involve students uh, in the impact that they have on shaping their culture and expectations and really saying, hey, you know, bullying is not, not okay here in, in our school. You know, I, this is my school too. And, and kind of think, you know, the adults do the discipline and, and set the school culture and, and things. But, you know, it's, uh, we have X number of adults in the school, but we have a thousand students and that's their home for eight hours a day um i think also working with students that there is uh, that students need not be afraid to report for re fear of retaliation and that comes from an administration and teachers uh, putting that strong culture statement out there of saying um, if there is uh, retaliation that will be addressed um you know very directly by administration because um, I've heard firsthand from students where they would say retaliation would be a concern and then also the fact of, well, if I report it and nothing's done, then I'm not going to report it next time. So it's making sure that, that um, the report is, has the follow through. And then kind of in conclusion on that, that question, Joe, um, frankly, I, I think schools have a lack of relevant data about their building. And... What we did in the forest in the last two years is we surveyed our middle school and high school students about school culture in depth. And we took that survey, took pieces of that out and presented it to the entire staff at the start of the school year. And we had questions such as, you know, basic, like, have you been bullied at school? Have you been bullied, you know, via electronic device and things like that? But we also had questions of, is there somebody at school that you can go to if you have a concern or problem? Is there somebody at school you feel connected to? And surprisingly, you know, that number was about 80%, I think, at the middle school and about 70% at the high school. And when you present that to staff, it takes them back a little bit because they, they look at that and think, boy, I, 
I feel like students can approach me at any time that we have this connection, but that, that needs to be, I, I think, built, you know, purposely built and purposely uh, to reach out to kids and get that connection with, with staff. Um, I've always been a big fan of the, the Centers for Disease Control um, Protective Behaviors report that came out in 2009, which really says work hard schools on building connections with students because that's going to have a big impact on your school culture and uh, preventing things such as bullying. I so appreciate I, the, the thoughtful response. I mean, that was uh, very comprehensive. And you started to allude to the fact that some of the things that you're doing there in DeForest, you find to be quite helpful in shaping that school culture. You're surveying the students, bringing those results back to staff, having facilitating discussion about uh, where are some things that maybe are just misperceptions. And you shared with me that staff perhaps had thought that that percentage might be closer to 100%. Uh, oh, absolutely. So absolutely. very interesting to have that type of a survey and then be able to bring those results back. And so let's talk a little bit about some of those other strategies that you feel like are most effective in changing the social culture in the schools today. Um, Joe, our, our district embraces restorative practices. And I know that you've, you've spoken uh, previously expert interviews with Paul Herrick and Aaron Tarnitzer uh, from Wisconsin, who are, are both experts in that area. Um, but restorative practice is, is much different than the traditional punitive discipline. It's the act of making the school community whole again. And uh, again, that brings a vesting of students into their school community. And it also uh, it, it repairs the harm typically that, that has been done to other students and to other staff members. So restorative practices, uh, we've heard a lot about positive behavioral interventions and supports. And, uh, you know, frankly, because it is effective to make sure that students are aware of expectations uh, in the school setting. Um, we do a lot of uh, public service announcements, a lot of video clips that students put together about what they expect um, for the culture of their school and to model that out for, um, for other students. And, uh, you know, th there are small things that can be done. I was working uh, with a school district years ago where the superintendent every day would be out in front of a school building and he would be uh, shaking hands of every kid that came in. And he would also require the administrators and the teachers to be outside and, and as kids came up to, to, you know, greet them and welcome them into the building. And, Again, you know, that's a culture setting uh, statement. Um, I, I'm a big believer in peer mentors, connecting kids up with other kids and having that bond, especially older students and, and younger students, I believe um, that that goes a long way in promoting a very positive school culture and kids connected to kids. And of course, uh, you know, you have to have fun in in school and have, have school be a, a place where kids feel that they can be fun and expressive. Uh, some of the neatest things I've seen in our district, um, you know, we have principals where if uh, students have a certain threshold that they reach of attendance or reading books or, you know, behavior or something like that, the principal might put his desk up on the roof for a day. And, and of course, this is Wisconsin. If that's winter, that's, that's, uh, that's quite a feat. But, you know, the whole thing is, um, to, to have a little bit of reflection, a little bit of humanity, and, and be able to see some of the administrators. And then also um, having students celebrate when they are hitting some of those thresholds. Because uh, I, I think sometimes we don't, we don't let students exactly know what we're expecting of them, too. So they're kind of wandering around in, in the school day and in the school year. And, and uh, I think that's a positive. Um, so another, you know, another thing that, that is kind, kind of colliding with this right now, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out is the increase in school security that we've, we've, um, you know, we've had that, the pressure since some of the recent events across the nation. And, and it's going to be a real careful balance to make sure that we continue to have an environment where kids feel they can be expressive and safe um, and an environment where, you know, we, we convey something that might be more of a fear or defense stance um, to kids. So I think there's going to be a balance in that too. Your work on the, uh, the state school crisis preparedness committee, I alluded to that in uh, your bio when, we, when I first introduced you. Tell me how that is going to help to continue to shape some of the, the school culture. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I certainly will. Um, as we look immediately, the response um, from our community and from most communities, uh, for example, a after the incident um, that um, you know happened right before Christmas with the elementary school out east, um, we we convened a special meeting. The committee did. And a lot of the discussion initially uh, was how to respond to parents and community who feel that the answer is really building a fortress is to you know put in bulletproof glass and to put in all these security checkpoints and all of these things and and um, you know really the the emphasis also strongly needs to be on um, putting drills in place, training students, making them uh, you know aware of their environment and not instilling, I think, fear into people that, you know, I have to be afraid to come into, into my school building. Sure. Um, and really, when you, when you break it down into those type of things, um, you know, putting bulletproof glass in isn't effective, for example, because the police department would say that, you know, if they need to get into a building, um, you know, they can't have the building be a fortress either. So, um, it's, it's very interesting, Joe, right now, because I don't know if there are specific answers right. into where things will go, um, but I, we're going to see more drills, that's for sure, and I, we're actually doing a large district drill with um, 35 staff next week where we will do a, a, a simulation of a crisis activity. Um, there, there's more... Uh, work being done though involving students in how to respond to crisis situations in their schools. There's a pro program called STEP in Wisconsin, and that program uh, trains all fifth graders for schools that participate in how to respond. And it's not only, you know, if, if there were a, a active shooter situation, but what if there's a tornado or what if there's a fire in your school or, or these type of things. So um, with the counselors too, that we need to continue to reassure students that school is a safe place. It's very statistically safe. Uh, but, you know, the world um, is, you know, at times somewhat chaotic and unpredictable, and it always has been. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure students feel confident every day and they can make decisions and, and they're going to be in a safe environment. Absolutely. It sounds like it's going to be a topic of ongoing discussion for a while. But... Uh... Great to know that there are already steps that are being taken and people are talking about ideas and it's not an easy solution, uh, but really something that requires a lot of coordinated effort and a lot of conversation and a lot of uh, partnership between schools and students and, and, uh, and folks like yourself that are on statewide committees that can talk about this. So certainly appreciate your work in that regard. Um, final question for you. I know that you and I first came together two years ago at the Great Lakes Summit because I was looking for places to, uh, to go and meet people and talk about Spreeo, and you were coordinating this conference. And I know now that you get an opportunity to travel to a lot of conferences. Are there places, conferences, or events that you would recommend for school administrators that they attend if they want to find out more about school culture? Uh, there are. Uh, certainly um, in Wisconsin, in the Midwest, the Great Lakes School-Based Behavior Solutions Summit, which I was a co-founder, uh, I feel that has great value in um, identifying elements of school culture that can be addressed and then also specific strategies to address um, student uh, behavior and validating students and, and engaging them, connecting them into the school culture. Um, I will say I, I think there's a, an area, though, that is kind of exploding much more than other areas, Joe, and, and that's cyberbullying. Um, I attended a presentation uh, a month ago on cyberbullying by uh, Dr. Justin Patchen, who's a professor with the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, an exceptional <laughs> center. And Dr. Patchen really opened my eyes to the world of what... Um, students are engaging in as far as um, technology and, and communication and things in the cyber world. I thought I was pretty up on things and I came into that presentation believing I didn't have a lot to learn and boy uh, did I did I ever have an eye-opening um, and I you know I, I look at how we train or how we educate students to drive a car 
So yeah, behind the wheel training to take a test. It's a lot that goes into it. Uh, handing over the keys to the internet, there really isn't anything that goes into that. A lot of schools have very little for digital citizenship for professional development for students, a class or anything like that. And um, the number of websites and the number of ways that, that students can, um, if it's a bullying incident, for example, that students can target other students, it, it's, it's just incredible how fast and in the moment that can happen. And it can, you know, 24 hours a day. And with the ability to take, um, you know, to, to take any information that a student has put out there, if there's a picture they posted of themselves on, you know, Facebook, standing, um, you know, next to a fish that they caught. Somebody, another student could go in there and take that picture and take their head off and put it on another picture and, and make a fake page and, 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 you know, engage in some type of, uh, you know, bullying or, or discrediting behavior. Now, most students, of course, that's, that's not going to happen. But, I mean, for students that are already um, engaged in those type of behaviors, this is now a means that has become anonymous in most regards. Uh, you know, Joe, if you and I were walking down the hallway and somebody uh, bumps into us, you're going to say, hey, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. To get cut off in rush hour traffic, you might honk that horn a little bit uh, because, you know, you're not in that face-to-face. -face. Well, you know, now imagine if you're, if you're even more removed and you're on a computer screen and, and you don't have to interact uh, directly with that other person. So um, I'm, I'm really feeling students um, are lacking the knowledge of how to also protect themselves in the digital world mm -hmm. and putting too much information out there which is making them vulnerable and susceptible to becoming um, targets of bullying or other discrediting type of behaviors. So we need to do a much more aggressive job with that in schools of saying anything you put out there really stays out there. There's a website, I believe it's uh, archive.org, where you can type in a website and a date and it will show you what was on that website at that specific time. So I, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a Facebook user and, and it's easy to post pictures of Christmas and other things out there. And, um, you know, I can use my adult judgment on that. But again, as a um, student, uh, especially a middle school student or high school student, it can be very easy to post information out there. And it can also be easy to post information and which might be demeaning toward others. Um, that, that really, I would say, Joe, would probably be the top in professional development that I would recommend if there were conferences on educating about cyberbullying. An interesting point that Dr. Patchen shared is his presentation changes every time he gives it. There are new websites out there. Um, there are new types of devices, new apps, and things like that that students um, kind of catch on. I remember back in the days, you know, MySpace was the thing, and then it became... Um, uh, Facebook and now you know there's there, there are so many other things kind of happening out there. I teach a, a college course for um, people who want to become directors of student services and I'm teaching the course in a few weeks and I, I rebuilt it to add more of the cyberbullying awareness from a student services perspective but some of the materials I use to talk about um, trends in the future well I put those up a year ago and they're already outdated Things have gone so much beyond that in the student world. Um, but Joe, again, to go to conferences about this, but it's one thing also to hear it from students, to sit down with students and say, what's happening in the digital world? What are some of the things that you're doing? Students will say, well, you can use Instagram, which I didn't know about, and send a picture and it'll only be there for three seconds and then it'll be gone. Or here's what we do on Tumblr or on these other sites because they'll, they'll tell you. Um, but I, I, I think there's, there's a great naive um, kind of perception out there that as adults, we've got, we've got the technology figured out. So, you know, they're on Facebook or they're texting. Well, there's much more than that. Um, to, to come back kind of into the last step of professional development, um, I'm working on what would be a, a bully crisis tabletop exercise and I'll be doing that with my district 
But to do an actual simulation internally for professional development with your, your district, and you can have you know one building do that, or you can have all of your buildings do that together. But you you know a scenario that I'm working on right now is um, let's say we have students come in in the morning and they report out that hey I just got a text from the student who uh, they were being bullied last night through some social media means. They're not in school today. They're texting me and saying you know I'm really depressed. My life is ruined and all of this stuff. Um, you know, how do you respond to that then as a school? What's your response to that? And then maybe there's other students involved. Because that happens. We actually had something very similar happen uh, this year, almost identical to that scenario. Um, so I, I think to get those response practices down as administrators is, is also uh, very critical. Like any other crisis, I think this one in particular because of students' pervasive use of technology. And as you said, most kids using it in positive ways, but when there is a decision made and it is a cyberbullying type of incident, uh, the impact of that incident can be dramatic. And having a response in place that you've practiced, that you've prepared for, I, th I think it just makes a lot of sense right now for schools to be doing that. And so, so appreciate your work uh, in putting that table topic type of scenario together. I can see where that's going to be a great benefit, not only to people in your district, but if others were to come to you uh, for that information, I, I mean, I, I just don't see that it wouldn't be of great value. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you have shared with us yet once again, uh, some wonderful information that I know folks are going to benefit from across the board, from school administrators to parents uh, that will watch this and uh, learn from it. And uh, congratulations again. I so appreciate you being a part of, of what we do here at Spurgio and um, being somebody that we could take the time to acknowledge through the award. I appreciate that, Joe. Uh, it's, it's always terrific to work with Spurgio. Uh, we found uh, the system to be incredibly uh, beneficial to our district, extremely reliable and, and um, keeps us informed uh, in the moment of our, our student culture and student needs. It's made a huge positive impact for us in the forest. So thank you also for, for the uh, excellent system that you've uh, put together. You're welcome. I appreciate you saying that. This has been David Proden and Joe Brze, CEO and founder of Sprigio. Look back for another expert coming to you this coming month. Take care.